Thank you, Ellen Karras and Ed Lachman. It's a pleasure to be with you. And thank you so much for agreeing to talk to me about some things that happened a long time ago. Uh, two films uh, that we, we were lucky enough to be part of at St. Anne's Warehouse. We were at St. Anne's Church at the time for the first one, which was Songs for Drella, which was the reunion of Lou Reed and John Cale. And Ed um, Lachman was the director and cinematographer. And then 17 years later, when we had moved to Dumbo, Ellen was a cinematographer for Lou Reed's Berlin. And we're streaming both of those, those concerts. Um, and I'm very interested, and I think a lot of people are interested in the fact that, we, that those concerts have been made into bona fide films. They're not just video archival recordings of, of great music, they're actual films. And so Lou's not here to talk for himself, sadly. John doesn't talk that, that readily about what he's doing. He's alive and well and making great music himself out in California. Um, Anony is still with us, but he's in Ireland. Um, Sharon Jones is no longer with us, unfortunately, from, uh, from Berlin. So in some ways, you've made the living. Uh, oh, and Julian, Julian Schnabel, he's very much alive and well and very supportive of the fact that we're doing, the, doing uh, uh, Berlin. And Laurie Anderson is really excited that we're doing both of them. So I'm very happy to do that. Um, I really, I want to introduce you both. You're both award-winning, amazing filmmakers. Um, Ed, uh, the directors you, you've worked with, Paul Schrader, Todd Haynes, Steven Soderbergh, Ulrich Seidel. You, you did Carol with uh, Kate Blanchett recently. Two, two of the, show, uh, the movies that you've done that, that I love that I've seen recently was I'm Not There. I love that film. And, um, and then you've also done uh, Desperately Seeking Susan, is that right? And Aaron Brockovich. I mean, there's, there's a lot of rock, rock related movies and even political activism, which I also think is really interesting how that goes with rock and roll. And we talk a lot about the intersection of theater and rock and roll and that, act, that activism that, that goes to that. Um, Ellen, one of my favorite movies ever, The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, that last scene in that hallway, I could still get the chills thinking about it. Um, Michelle Gondry, uh, Jim Jarmusch, Spike Lee. I just watched The Four Little Girls a couple of weeks ago, and now you've done American Utopia, which was so great on stage that I didn't imagine how you could capture it on film, but all the joy is there, and to be able to see it in, in close-up was, was a thrill. Um, you've worked on The Night of Steve Zalian. That was a very haunting piece. I have, I have to say, I actually couldn't watch the whole first episode because I knew something terrible was going to happen. I just couldn't. It was so frightening. Anyway, um, yeah, Jim Jarmusch. So, I mean, between the two of you, you've worked with the great people. Oh, Martin Scorsese, the Dylan, the Dylan movies, the Rolling Thunder Review, I also watched recently. Anything with Bob Dylan where you can see him up close doing something different uh, in a new way, I'm, I'm there for that. Um, you did I Shot Andy Warhol. So there's like these sort of cross currents between the mm -hmm. two of you. You know, you shot the people who were with the guys who shot Andy Warhol, Ed, and now Ellen did the movie. So anyway, it's, uh, it's very interesting. So I want to get into the relationship between you two because I really want to have you talk to each other. And then I want to get into how you made the movies. Um, they're very different. Uh, so Ed, I would love for you to start a little bit about Drella and what your challenges were and and then Ellen. And then I'll pop in with my little thoughts from having been there. Right. Well, it was, um, it, it was a project that came out of England, Channel 4 and initial films. And I had done uh, this, it was um, Red Hot and Blue. It was an AIDS benefit film with different artists. And I was going to do one with, um, Annie Lennox and Derek Jarman, and Jarman, Derek Jarman became too ill. 
And uh, so they asked me to do it. And I used his home movies over her face. Anyway, because of that, they asked me then to do this concert film with Lou and uh, John Cale, Songs for Drello. So I, I, I went to BAM, I saw it at BAM, and I went to the, some rehearsals, and I realized it was more than a concert film, that it was kind of a, more than an homage, it was almost like a requiem or a, a dirge or um, a, 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 like a representation of their relationship with him. And I knew that, uh, they were very sensitive of how the cameras would would interfere with the audience. And that's when it came to me, the idea of encapsulating them in this darkness in, in like their own, um, like a diary. The, 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 the lyrics, the songs were like a diary of Andy's life coming to New York, his background in, in Pittsburgh, his Czech background, and the evolution of Andy and his relationship to the people around him, and certainly to Lou and, and John. And um, so I said to Lou, and maybe this is what broke the ice with Lou, as I said, I, I don't think we should really shoot it as a performance film, but as something else. And um, so, I did shoot one performance, but I was way off the stage. I used long lenses because uh, certainly he didn't want the camera to be an interference between the audience and the and his performance because of the intimacy of the the piece. And and then we shot two days after he agreed to shoot two days after, but I went shot it all the way through. I had myself and five other cameras. And I set up and I I set up the camera differently for each song. So that's maybe why it feels different than a a performance, uh, you know, piece. Um, so is that I, why there were blackouts between each song? Well, I think that was an editing device that we we did, you know. Um, but for me, it was like a poem in verse and. Um, and there's also a certain, it's about observation. And I realized something because I'm old enough that I, I knew Andy Warhol and I had been to the factory um, that as much as people thought about Andy as some kind of uh, um, voyeur or Svengali, he, I think he was very shy and he always observed and I felt that's what would be befitting for the piece is that if the camera felt as an observational piece and also about the relationship between John and, and Lou. So that. That's really interesting because when I watched it many years ago and then just watched it recently, you know, I felt like it's almost as if I was in Andy's place. And they, you know, I was there standing there listening to each of them sing, you know, it, to me, you know, I mean, I was, it, as I was this present that was an, an you know, there was an unseen, but very, very felt presence. That was, that was the hope, you know, that, you know, you know, you do, you know, we do these things and they're not literal, but uh, the, the power of images are the, the sublimation of the of the emotions, and and um, so it, it, I wanted it possibly to evoke kind of a confessional through what the music was and the spirit, like you said, the spirit of Andy, like if he was there watching them. Yeah, yeah, and that was very very well felt, very much felt because of where you put the camera because of how quiet it was in the beginning. I mean, I almost felt like I was standing there looking, there's Lou and looking over and there's John. And sometimes John is looking at Lou and Lou is very much in his own world and rarely looks up at John. But yeah, very much felt that. I mean, I love the, 
intimacy of it, you know, which is very much in contrast to Berlin. And I wish that I could have gotten the intimacy in the same way, but, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't the director, you know, Julian was a director, but, and it was a very different piece, Berlin, and, you know, made for different reasons. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I love how they are in that dark space and you just really just feel them. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what, I, what, I, what I also love about it, I'm sorry, Ed, was that I also felt like you captured them making music like the personal, the personal feeling of, of making music, like Lou, especially, you could see him going with what he's hearing and what the great pleasure of, of making music and then John doing the same thing. And then where they would actually connect with each other, the intimacy between them, that's where I saw the intimacy. And Ellen, I actually saw that very much in Berlin as well. Maybe it's from working with musicians so much, where you, they, where where they're in love is in the music. Yeah, and, and you you see that in both movies. Well, that's the big hope is to be able to be close to them, you know, and to be able to go where you normally wouldn't be able to go as an audience member, whether you're in a concert or performance. You know, is being able to stand right next to the performer as if you're with them. You know, that is always the biggest challenge, especially when you have an audience. So like, like, uh, you know, we were talking about having two performances where it could just be the camera or you're allowed to go wherever you are with the camera with the audience is well aware of that. That that is when the magic starts to happen when you can actually be really present when you're not out. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, we have to get shots from the outside where you, you can see the wide shot. Not necessarily all the time, you know, it depends on conceptually how you approach the piece. But, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think that's where Ed and I are very similar is that we approach our work conceptually first. We think about it in terms of what the meaning is and then the meaning is what informs how you shoot it, where you put the cameras, what the lighting is. It's all about, you know, creating that, the, the meaning and what you want to say with the piece and, and so, um, and I think the other place where we intersect a lot is in what you said in activism. You know, I think both of us are very much aware and, you know, through what we do with our work, the kind of projects that we choose to do, you know, very much as, in, as you know, statements about art, about the world, about music, about people. Um, and I know that you know, seeing the kind of films that you do, Ed, very much is, you know, informs the kind of films I do. And, you know, I've been watching your career for a long, long time. You know, <laughs> remember when I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we are kindred spirits in many ways. You know, we, we, we have a, uh, there's a special connection, I think, and with cinematographers. And, and with, you know, as directors too, I mean, you directed that piece as well and you really see your vision, not only your vision, but how you hear it, you know, and how you want us to experience it. And also you, you respected three very withdrawn people and brought them out. You know, you, you talk about Andy Shyness, which is amazing and John, John's shyness and, and Lou's shyness. Mm -hmm. In, you know, you're talking about people who only express themselves most fully through, through their art. So that was kind of genius in a way to be able to hold it and then give it out to, to us. Well, they're singing to themselves as, as well as to an audience, but taking the audience out of it made them feel more like they're playing to themselves. And I, I think it's very revealing because I also feel there's a narrative in the in songs for Drella. So I had something to go with, but there's a remorse, even lose remorse to his relationship to uh you know Andy, which in, in certain songs come out, you know even in the last song, Hello, It's Me, you know, where he's, he says, you know, I, I paid you a tribute too late. 
you know, I didn't, I didn't know, you know, what you were trying to do for us. Yeah, my favorite line in there is he says, I thought you, um, it was, it was Billy Name who was locked up in his room and I thought you asked me for some speed and I thought it was for you. Like he's, he's like, he's, he's apologizing for every slight. That's what, that's what, I, I find it amazing that number one, he wrote a lyric. Right. Like mm -hmm. that, but yeah. told the whole story in that lim in that lyric. Yeah, he actually says, I doubted you had a good heart right. and late in coming to honor you. But many of the, the songs are different aspects of their relationship to Andy, but also Andy's relationship to others. That's what I found interesting, which I felt was more like a diary, you know, and, and you, I know you, mm -hmm. said, we talked about how did this affect you? I, I think that music affected me more over the years. I mean, I, I it was kind of lost. It was only on a laser disc and it's taken me like six or eight months to try to find it. Actually, you, you found it, thank you. Because we still couldn't unearth the, or a better copy of it, even though it was shot in 16 millimeter and, and also Ellen's was shot in 16 millimeter. You know, it's it's been so degraded by the, uh, in the formats that it's shown in, which is sad. Yeah. The thing I wanted to tell Ellen, funny enough, about Berlin I actually, 48 years ago, did that video, and I've never been able to find it. And you, you did the Berlin video? Wow. And I kind of knew who Lou Reed was, and he came up to me at the camera and kicked the tripod, and he said, do it like Andy, and I said, what the fuck is that? So I asked him, kidding, I said, do you remember I did that and you kicked my tripod? He said, I don't remember anything back then. <laughs> um, I, was, I had my trepidation, but I, I had a very positive experience working with both of them. Mm. Yeah, me too. And you know, here's where we intersect again. So I shot, I shot Andy Warhol which was a film before this. In, we shot that in 1995. And, you know, it's all about Valerie Solanas and her side of the story and going to the factory and then ultimately shooting Andy. And so this film, and well, this piece, I mean, is, is kind of the prequel sequel to it. I mean, it's, you know, the fact that it's, it's just... I almost feel like I'm walking through history with you, you know, in terms of these musicians and these lives and New York history. And, and, you know, we, we very much have been on the streets of New York. I mean, we both have documented through our films, you know, New York, the people, but, you know, if that is, that's such a close connection, you know, to me, it was like, okay, you know, you know, I it really, you know, I, I, I was really honored to work with Lou. You know, he was very humble and, you know, he was, he was very wary and shy. I agree. And I find that a lot of musicians are really shy. I mean, someone like, um, like Bob Dylan is very shy and people interpret it as being arrogant and put off, but it's not at all. He's very, very shy person. And it's like, like, Ed is saying, you know, they they express themselves through their music, and and they see the world sees them through their music. So, I it's remember, interesting to see that part of of Lou. I remember at the first rehearsal of Berlin, um, Lou was going through, he was you know sort of walking through the piece like first time, and uh, right before we took a break, he did the song um, "Men of Good Fortune." And he sings the song and he, and the song ends and he comes down the steps and I was right there and he goes, who wrote that song? And he was very emotional. He said, who wrote, who wrote that song? And I went, you, you did. He said, oh yeah, I did. And 
he was like experiencing it for the first time himself. And it was very, I think that, I think he was very moved the whole, I think the whole thing was like a revelation as he was doing it. it and um, I think it was John Perales in, in his review said, Lou wasn't singing the songs he would, or reinventing the songs, he was actually inhabiting the songs. And I think, I think that was a really fair thing, fair thing to say. Um, it, it, this is a good segue for a second um, to talk a little bit about how, so Ed had this, you know, exterior taking the whole thing in view, giving the guys a lot of distance to be intimate, which sounds like a contradiction, but it wasn't. You, I call crouching tiger. <laughs> Could you tell everybody where you were when you were filming Berlin? Oh my God. I was everywhere because I mean, when Berlin came together as a film, uh, we had very little prep time. You know, it was, yeah, I don't even remember. Hey. Maybe it was a week, but we, we, and we didn't have, we had very little money. So, uh, so we got everybody together and everybody worked as if I remember pro bono on it, you know, for the whole time, because we just love his music. But my big challenge was how to get closer, how to be, how to get those intimate shots. And I know, you know, Lou is very much like he didn't want any cameras close to him. And I, I just thought, um, I'm not going to, you know, I have to get close. So I ended up, and I don't know if you know this, uh, Ed, but I convinced Julian to let me handhold, you know, in front of Lou, down in the pit, in front of the audience, with a swing and tilt series of lenses. So shift and tilt lenses are, um, they're, they're based on still photography, like architectural photography, where they have a bellows and you put the lens is at the end of the bellows and it allows you to throw certain parts of the, of the frame out of focus. So he let me do this because I was like, I want to be able to get long lens and to be, you know, throw certain parts of the frame out of focus. So I was around in the front, in front of the audience, you know, trying to find those spots where I could hide myself from the audience and from the other cameras, but also get these shots of Lou. And, and also then when we were allowed to be on the stage, which was that one day that the audience came and they, they came for free, you know, I was, I really wanted to stand right next to Lou. So at one point I walk right up and I'm literally this far away from him, you know, and he turns to me, stops, he turns to me and he, gives me this look and I'm like, I give him this nod, like I'm here for you or something like that. And so he turns back and he's like, okay. And he keeps on going. Do you remember that? It was, it was like, he gave me permission. And after that, he came to me and he said, he says, you're the only one I will ever allow to shoot me from below or that close, you know? So, so that's why it was crouching tiger, I guess. <laughs> I just remember you, uh, for some reason, I remember you kneeling like upstage, but um, Bob Ezra and I thought was like to your right, you know, conducting. Remember mm -hmm. he had the word Berlin on his back. Anyway, yeah. he was there and then, and then, and then the kids were to the right also. And then you were, I just remember you crowd and, and then Tony Thunder <laughs> had his, his plastic barriers Around the, the drum set, yeah. Around the drum set, and you, you were somehow right in front of that. And um, the shot that I know you must have been the one that got was was the shot of Lou listening to Anthony or Anony sing "Candy, Candy Says," oh. which is... uh, I was completely blown away by that. I mean. You know, here I was, I was trying to make myself invisible on the stage, which, you know, or, you know, Ed is not easy. <laughs> but, you know, the, that music and his, well, Anthony's voice was just took me away. I mean, it, we, I think we all were in that rap space, you know, it's just magical. It was an unearthly, heavenly voice that transported everyone. And I'll never forget that moment. I mean, that 
stayed with me and still stays with me, you know, today is that the, that sound of her voice. And then when they sing together, I'm gonna, like he says, I'm gonna watch the bluebirds fly. Lou starts to sing that. And then mm. they start noodling together and their voices are wrapping around each other. It was, it was breathtaking. And, and it's, it's actually in the film. So let's depart from the music for one second, just do a take back in history. And Susan, you can be the best one to tell us because I think it's really important that people know what happened back in the early 70s when the album first came out, Berlin, and why this concert was so significant. He had, he had, he had put out a record called Transformer, which was his big, big hit record with the big hit single, Walk on the Wild Side. And it was, it was a commercial success. And the record companies um, gave him permission to make whatever record he wanted to make next. And they were expecting some kind of a follow-up to Transformer. So they expected another big hit record. And of course, Lou, isn't the type of person that would think in terms of something being a big hit record. You know what I mean? It's not, it wouldn't even, I don't even know if he would want to make what would be called a big hit record, but I'm sure he enjoyed the success and the fact that people love the music. And, and also, you know, Walk on the Wild Side is, is a great, talking about narratives, the two of you, it's such a great storytelling song as well as a great song. So um, that's not what happened. He made Berlin which was about these drug addicts and expats living on the outskirts of the walled city. And mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of jealousy and rage. And it's, it's about Caroline and Jim. And Caroline and Jim uh, have this kind of codependent, sick relationship. And um, she's, she's very active sexually and he's a bit abusive and insecure and she has a child and, or children. And so he tells this story, this very, very dark story. And the, um, in, in the most beautiful, beautifully orchestrated way. And the record companies just hated it. The critics hated it and they panned it. And, and Lou was devastated and he just basically put it back in a drawer and he, he, he performed songs from it, but he never, he never heard it or performed it in one as one complete uh, concept album, which is what, which is really what it was. So. So you brought it, you went to Lou and you said, I want to stay in yeah. Berlin. I right. said, yeah, I would like you to, would you be willing to do Berlin because my cousin Peter had had given it to me uh, you know on a cassette <laughs> I think it was and I listened to it and I was so moved by it and I just um uh, so I remember we met in the uh, in the West Village San Ambrosius or something and Hal came and by then it's Hal we, Wilmer who's just recently died from COVID by the way yeah, which is sadly which is also why we brought brought these music these music films out because we did a tribute to Hal after he died, which was so devastating in April. And so we did this tribute to Hal Wilner remotely, you know, and Janine Nichols, who, who was our program director, made a beautiful tape, a beautiful playlist, which you can get on Spotify. You can listen to it of Hal produced music, just gorgeous. Um, and, and I realized that we got such a big response to that of people listening to it and, and, and they didn't know that history, you know, cause we've been doing theater in Dumbo and we always said, you know, that our, our theme is sort of like where music meets rock and roll, the intersection where music meets rock, and, uh, theater meets rock, rock and roll at the intersection where theater meets rock and roll. Um, and so we had, I realized this was be a good moment in the pandemic that we had these two beautiful films. We didn't want to do any archival streaming, that it would be a good chance for people to know more about our roots and our history. So that's why, that's why we decided to do it. But Hal 
came with me because after Drella, um, we did a lot of work with, with Lou in tribute concerts that Hal produced at, at the church, at St. Anne's Church, which was our original home. And so he came with me um, to meet with Lou and we had a conversation. And, um, you know, Lou was very reticent at first and then he was kind of interested. And then we were just doing the back and forth of why it would be great and what the music could be and who could be part of it. And, and then he, he warmed to it. And then the next big issue was who's gonna sing it because he's too old. And Hal and I were like, no, you are singing it. This is your voice. You're singing it, please, you have to sing it. So that was, I think he was happy that we had that reaction, but, but that, that took him a lot, you know, that, that was, took a little bit of, of coaxing. And then once that was decided, he said, oh, you know who, who I think could maybe direct it um, is Julian. He said, Julian Schnabel loves Berlin. I bet you he would do it. He was making um, uh, his, his movie in, um, in Paris at the time we called, called um, Julian and he said, absolutely, I'll do it and I'll design it. And so that's, uh, that's how that happened. Well, I have a question, you know, because when I first saw it, um, it, it had this multimedia quality to it which was for me like a lot like the Velvet Underground. Mm -hmm. Was that in um, Julian's idea? You know, because there's a lot of multiple imagery and then you also have a narrative with um, Emmanuel Segni, you know. Segni. Mm -hmm. yeah, if you could explain uh, kind of the concept visually that he and you were playing with. Yeah, so he um, he wanted to do these projections and I was really keen on doing the projections because I'd always been interested in, in projections ever since I did Unzipped when I was in Paris and uh, they, were, they were doing these huge projections on, on, um, on the sides of buildings and it's a tradition in Lyon in, in France. So I had been following this whole idea of how to layer meaning with projections, you know? So, um, so Julian had his, one of his daughter, well, had his daughter um, go out and take a Bolex. And she was doing some of the, the, some of the advanced work that she had been doing it before, actually, when he first, before I came on, she had already been starting to film some of these pieces with Emmanuel. So, we, I also filmed some of the background and she also did some of the background and, um, and, you know, part of the challenge of doing any kind of projection, as we know, in a live theater space is, you know, making the lighting um, consistent with the projection so that when you expose it, it's the right relationship. So that was really what was tricky because there was a lighting designer already in place for the performance for the theatrical performance and not for the film. So we had to approach a lighting designer um, about, you know, about making the adjustments on that, which was a little bit of a challenge <laughs> because lighting designers for theater are usually, you know, they're very adamant about keeping the light very strong. You know, if you have a very strong backlight, it has a certain, a certain message. There's a certain kind of impact on the live audience. So that was really tricky in terms of, you know, with the dealing with the projections and the actual technical aspect of it. But what I loved about the kind of layering that it provided is, you know, it just gave this, uh, this depth to the space uh, and, and the space, which was also had part of Julian's um, idea of hanging these different um, uh, panels. So he had had these panels and I remember I went to his, to his studio, we were talking about what else he was going to put on these panels. And he said, these panels need something and him being an artist and thinking about space and, and dimension and three dimensional space and all of that kind of stuff. He ended up pouring clear resin over the back of the panels. 
And then he's like, well, we need something else. So he ended up taking this couch that was in his studio and painting a stripe across it, almost like a cow, and then hanging it up off of, remember that, Susan? When of he was course. like, no, you're not to hang it. Which of, you know, and then I brought in this piece of Chinese, uh, I was a banner written in Chinese that I had gotten in Vietnam years and years ago. And I said, here, you can have this if you want to use it. So he's like, okay, I'm taking this. So he hung that up as well. And, and, and there we have the set. And, and then the projections were put upon that. You know, so here you have all of this layering, you know, in actual space, but then when you project it onto a film, you know, it ends up becoming two dimensional. And I found that really interesting because it was almost like living paintings. But, you know, I know that when the show traveled, <laughs> it ended up being such a challenge for them to travel that show because they had to travel the couch. They had to figure out how they were going to hang the couch. All the panels, everything had to go with them. <laughs> Here's my story about the couch. The couch was supposed to go to Australia. And it was around Christmas that everything was getting packed up. And I think it was going to cost like $10,000 just for the couch. Yeah, so the producer, the producer in Australia calls me up and he goes, well, can't we just like get a couch here? So I go to Julian. This, this was such a good lesson for me. I go to Julian. I go, so Julian, do you think that maybe we could use a cat, pick up a couch on the other side? He goes, my stripe, my couch. That was the <laughs> answer. So, okay, pack up. Couch is going, right? It gets to Berlin, every, not Berlin, everything gets to Australia and they're unpacking it and the couch is not in the, in the, um, in the it's not there. Somehow they had left the couch in the shipping container place and it didn't get shipped. So we ended up having to spend probably like $15,000 to get the couch shipped express just to get there. So that couch was very important, <laughs> but I'll never forget that. My stripe, my couch. Okay, sorry, never do that again. Well, th th there was a difference because I stripped everything away. I almost didn't want you to know where you were. It, they were in this void, this isolation. I was very fortunate to work with uh, Jerome Searling, who is a brilliant uh, designer, a theater designer, and does operas. And he's worked with Madonna, and he's worked with Glass, Philip Glass. He's worked with everybody. And so he had done these beautiful projections so I did try to combine those in this void but I almost didn't want you to know where you were in their psyche in the imagery of where they were playing. What also really worked about that Ed was that BAM hadn't cleared the rights from the Warhol estate so when we did it we used two projections from the Warhol estate of Warhol pictures and so, so Jerry actually had to make his own images. So he, he kind of did them after Warhol. So, so you got a very, very special thing that otherwise could have just sort of, you, you know, taken away the mystery. So kind of kept the mystery there and kind of Warhol's there, but Warhol's not there. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up those projections because they were very different. Yeah. yeah. And very beautiful. Like, I remember one had a big empty window, right? And so I think that, a loop. Yeah, that was an early song, you know, Come to My House, you know, when he, his friends and he talks about, you know, check. Uh, Open house. house. Open house. He has images, you know, they were almost like black and white codoliths, images of his friends, which was in the spirit of early Warhol's films. So that, that was mm -hmm. an element that kind of helped reinforce mm -hmm. the songs. Well, I'm enough to <laughs> receive that, you know. And it had a fullness that I think 
I think there's a similarity again between the two pieces because the backdrop still becomes a backdrop. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the mm -hmm. backdrop still make a statement on what, what's happening and but they're still behind them. Um, Ellen, do you want to talk about a little bit about how you negotiated the issue about <laughs> the lighting? Because that's an ongoing issue for, for people who want to, I mean, now we work with projections all the time and computers, but you know, for many years, people were using xenon projectors and you had to balance the projection with the lighting and which comes first and what's more important and all that stuff. Um, and one thing about Jennifer Tipton's lights is she, she only used white light. Mm -hmm. so I don't know how that affected you, but. Well, she was very much a purist and um, I had um, a note about her, her work for many, many years. You know, I knew that she was teaching at Yale. I even considered taking a class and, and auditing her class over at Yale. Um, and I had actually worked with her lighting at one other point on a film that we that was called Roy Cohn, Jack Smith, which was with Ron Vauder, which we filmed before Ron Vauder died. And um, so when I, you know, was looking at what she was doing, when we went to go and meet her, so Julian and I went to go and meet her as she was there with her team putting the lighting together, I knew that I was going to have to have a conversation with her about um, the levels, because what happens is, is that when, if you're an audience member in a performance, a live performance or a live theater, when you're seeing the lighting, you know, the lights can be very, very uh, strong, you know, the, and it can be very intense um, and, and beautiful, usually. I mean, there's that strong, pure light, white light often. And, but, if you're sitting on film, if you have that white light and it's four or five stops over, you're not going to see anything. All the detail is going to go away. So you're not going to get any kind of anything on the film. It'll just burn through. So I knew that I was going to have to talk to her about being able to bring down those levels in order to see some sort of detail. And um, so normally lighting designers, you know, are, you know, they, and they're, they're not the easiest to deal with because they stand by their lighting. But so Julian and I went over to talk to her and she didn't want to have anything to do with us. I mean, nothing did not even want to talk to us. And I was, you know, I, I was kind of shocked. I think Julian was shocked because Julian was the director of the performance. He was the director of the entire thing. And she just didn't want to talk to us. And so it was a big impasse. And I knew that, you know, we were shooting on film. I mean, it wouldn't work. You know, it, would just, it just wouldn't look right. And plus, because we had the projections to deal with, you know, I had to be able to make the lights even lower as in it together in unison so that I could open up the stop so that I could actually see the projections because otherwise I wouldn't even be able to see the projections and it would, you could see them by eye, but you wouldn't be able to see them on film. So um, we went back the second day to go and talk to her and nothing. I mean, here we have two big egos involved here, you know, where it was like one versus the other. And I have to say it was, I was, not to be deterred and I was really upset at the reception and I thought no you know uh with all due respect I have to talk to you so I called her up and I said listen you know it's this is not only about the, the performance the live performance you know we're trying to make this film so that it lasts for posterity I mean this is Lou's legacy besides the music you know is to do this so you know, please give us the respect. We respect your work. I will respect your work. So, and um, so anyway, so she listened and she, you know, she, she said, okay, you know, and we ended up finding that compromise and I worked with her board operator and I had my gaffer with me. So we all talked about it and that's the way we were able to, you know, bring some of the levels down, but, you know, in any kind of artistic collaboration, when, it, it doesn't start out 
uh, as a collaboration in the very beginning and other people are coming into it, it's always difficult because everybody wants to protect their work as much as they can and the way it looks. And I completely understood what she was talking about. It would change the way we receive it live in the audience, but it wasn't only about the live performance. But it really, the way you negotiated, because I remember also that Julian was angry at me because he felt like as the producer, I should be controlling the situation. And I don't know. Bizarre. Well, I'm downplaying. It was very volatile. <laughs> I, had, like, well, I decided, you know, I mean, I, for me, I was just like, I'm not going to get into, you know, we're not going to get into a screaming fight with anybody. It's just pick up the phone and call the person and talk human being to human being. And right, just, you know. did it. I mean, you negotiated it so well and it so paid off because the close ups on that, on that show, when you look at it, it it's, they're so beautiful and so crystal clear and you can see everybody, you can see the people. And then even the long shots are really gorgeous. So yeah. it was well represented and, and, and I'm glad, you know, that you two were able to, to work it out and that we got the best of everybody on, on that screen. And I feel the same way about Drella that we well, got that all the people that weren't there and were there. That's part of our job function is to be the shrink on the set. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Between the director and the producer, but many <laughs> times with the crew. So you, you try to help everybody so they can help you, you know? And so yeah. we are the ones that have to be the level headed, calm. I mean, there's always the stories about the divas, but. I think they've fallen by the wayside, you know, in, especially today, you, you know, one has to navigate that those personalities. So you did a good job, Al. <laughs> I want to ask you both, do you feel, because um, do you feel that <laughs> filming these live concerts, I mean, obviously you have such illustrious careers and so many great great films since them, but do you feel that there's something about that lesson and that that live quality and that the way light is used for somehow reality, but also for the, the dimensionality? Do you, do you feel that any of that perform, um, filming live performance has affected your filmmaking? I, I would say more of the, my documentary years, adapting to what's there and using it and implementing it. And so a concert is similar to that, where you have to maybe adjust it, but you have to work with what's there. So it's just a certain temperament. You know, do you go in and recreate the whole thing or do you work off of what's there? And certainly like what Ellen's talking about, when you go into concerts that have already been uh, lit by a lighting designer, they don't want you to interfere with what their look is, but obviously you want to capture their look on film. So you have to modify it, but make them feel that you're modifying it so it will look the way they want it to look. So that's the na navigation you go through. And I think New York cinematographers came up through documentary and there's a school of us that I think are much more adaptable when you even see their narrative work that works off of what's there. Maybe I would say, yeah, I think New York has more of a, a tendency of cinematographers that work off of what's there that rather than, or shooting on location rather than shooting on a stage. Yeah, I think that that's very, very true. And I think also because in New York, we have so many more obstacles to handle when you're on the streets, you know, whether you're doing documentary or you're doing fiction. I mean, we have to think on our feet all the time. I mean, even, you know, doing narrative filmmaking in New York, you almost feel like sometimes you're a documentarian because when you're on the streets, you can't control everything. And it, it isn't like in L.A. where everything is so much bigger. You know, New York, 
you know, we, when you're shooting in New York, I mean, it's just a different animal, you know, moving trucks through the streets is different. In LA, it's a very different kind of, of atmosphere. there's a lot more studio space. People tended to shoot more in the studios. That's the way it was. I mean, it's only recently that we had Steiner and some of the bigger gigantic stages, you know, a lot of people would shoot over in, um, what's the name of the place in Queens again? Uh, Silver yeah. Cup. You know, Silver Cup, you know, those stages are not, weren't as big as the stages you find in LA. There was a lot more space. So I agree with, with what Ed is saying. You know, we, we were, you know, we, we use what's there. I think that we are, you know, chameleons in trying to shape and, and, and make something different than rather than starting from scratch and building a whole thing. So I think... During performance, you know, it's always a challenge during performance when you have audience. So, for example, at the American Utopia, we had they had already sold out the entire run. So we had to decide which seats we were going to kill, even though people had already bought those seats. Because the moment you put a camera in the center of the audience, you're blocking 20 people behind you. So all of those, you can't put a crane in the audience necessarily when you have a paying audience. So, you know, the producers oftentimes will try to figure out how can you make uh, a performance where, you know, we shoot with the audience because you want the energy of the audience because the performers, they respond directly to the audience and then being able to get your close-ups with the same energy when there's no audience and when you're able to put cranes in the center or you have the camera on the stage, you know, and, and those are the kind of considerations because performances change according to the audience, you know, and, and the kind of, you know, what night that they're having and the response that they get, you know, the musicians, you know, they respond to that human presence. So. Which is such a wonderful note, I think to, uh, to end on because right now we can't we can't have that human presence you know <laughs> and so it's glorious to have the films you know it's fantastic that you made american utopia now and that we will have that and hopefully we'll, we'll all be able to get back together on stage and in audiences soon well thank you for showing it again because in my behalf, you know, Songs for Drella was very popular in Europe. It got great reaction there as, as the piece, in, as the film, but it never really was ever shown here. Mm. That's why it's actually been- The so same thing with Berlin. Yeah. So you, thank you for being, uh, you know, an outlet for it and hopefully maybe there'll be another life for it. That's the hope, the keepers of the legacy. I they call it the Lunaverse. That's what Lori calls it, the <laughs> Lunaverse. So we're keeping the Lunaverse alive on stage. So thank you both for making those movies and thank you for doing them for us. Thank you. Thank Love you for you. having us. Okay. Bye. Bye, Ed. Bye, Bye Suze. Bye. <laughs>